Ah, Cody. It's part two of this latest journey into the world of Jordan Peterson. But first, let's talk about that Mighty Mighty Boss Stones <laughs> album oh that they released in 2022 about the jo- murder of George Floyd and then the protests that followed. Oh. I can't believe you were not aware of this. I had no, I had no idea. Um, I, it, is, it is stunning. It is... I mean, just the fact that it exists is is uh, mm-hmm. just so beautiful and funny. Um, yeah, the, the fact that I I think we we can say the Mighty Mighty Boss to- Tones are the whitest a band has ever been without being explicitly a neo Nazi band. Mm-hmm. Like it it can't it can't be whiter than the Mighty yeah, Mighty no, Boss Tones. Yeah, no, they're like a, they're a, a goose step and a shuffle away from yeah. Uh, from not that, that they're Nazis, but 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 that no, it, no, no, it, no, it no. does not get more Caucasian. <laughs> um, and it's, I, I would say if that is your if you are the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones watching the the murder of this man and the protests that gripped the nation, perhaps the thing you should say is nothing like maybe you know obviously like uh, we'll we'll make a statement that like we support the protests or this was terrible but you certainly shouldn't write an entire album about george floyd that's just not a thing the world needs from the mighty mighty boss no. <laughs> oh, just or even you know yeah right you know an album um that if you like looked really hard you'd be like is this about george floyd maybe, yeah maybe if protests? you're like you're doing a song you know on your sky album about how the police are bad you could reference it that would be fine sky but, has a long history yeah. of being anti-authoritarian um, and, you know you know like if you know and then pro some proceeds to charity or something like that some cause i don't know but this is wild um i listened to uh also the song is called the killing of georgie um, which I would say is not a great title. Um, it's so weird. I listened to part three. I have I can't find part one or two anywhere, and I'm not buying that album. Um, even just some of these lyrics, George, Georgie, please stay. They took your breath away. Yeah, what the? F- that is an insane thing to write. That is that that because because again, the mighty mighty boss tones, a lot of musicians to band. A bunch of people were in a room when they handed those lyrics out, and all of them had to be like, "Yes, this is a song we're all going to take part in." They we're performed make it. This, they learned yeah, how it they, went. They made it. They made that into a music, and they just. Let it happen to the world, and no one stopped them. And one assumes they did that 12 times Mm -hmm. to get a whole album out of it. Yeah, it is. You know what? Sophie, (laughs) let's play a clip from this song for the listeners at home. Give give them 30 seconds. Give them a tight 30. I don't yeah, I was going to say the, the actual song just sounds like that one song. <laughs> they all, all, all mighty, mighty boss tone songs sound the same. They don't have the ability to make multiple ska sounds that sound different. They're not real big fish. No, no, no. It even has that scream that the it, guy does it, in that other song. Yeah. Oh, by the way, real big fish, you know how many albums they wrote about George Floyd? Not a single one. My guess was not a single one. Because real big fish understands that's not what America needs. They don't oh, need real big fish weighing in on this. You know, no, Godspeed, real with fish. Uh, credit mm-hmm. to them, but also I would probably answer none to any band mm-hmm. that you yeah. ask me about. Very, there are very few musicians whose specific take on this I need in the form of an album. Right? You know, Five Iron Frenzy, wonderful ska band, made a lot of statements about how the police are terrible in social media. They didn't cut an album. Didn't cut an album about it because <laughs> they knew. They knew. We don't need that. Nobody needs that. At least, at least one of them knew. Maybe mm-hmm. some of them were on board and had the idea, but one mm-hmm. of them was like, "Ah, I don't know, okay. guys." No. You got to get the chorus. You got to get in there. There we go. Skip ahead or no? Uh, yeah, a little yeah, bit. Give, give us some chorus. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Wow. 
I listened to it back like in 20, whenever it came out and was like, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. Um, and it, it's, it is so, it is the most cringeworthy thing. Like I, it's, it's one of the worst things I've ever heard. It's people so make. bad. Um, even like, like not, like I, ignoring- I have listened, Cody, I have listened to an entire discography of Blink-182 covers turned into Nazi anthems. Oh my God. Dozens of songs. Oh my God. Dozens. I have like 70 of them on my fucking hard drive. Dozens of them. And it was bad, but it didn't make me cringe like it's that. It's just like, yeah, like every, even if you, if, you, if you ignore the fact that this is about George Floyd mm-hmm. and they call him Georgie the entire time. Uh, Which, and by the, the way, album, did anyone call him Georgie? Was that ever his nickname? I don't think did so. you really invent a so. nickname for a murder victim and then make an album about it? Also, if like, if you're doing like, if you need two syllables because like melodically you need that mm-hmm. extra syllable, George Floyd is his name. Yeah, that's two. You got two right there. Yeah. Um, but maybe they wanted it to be uh, a little more, you know, discreet, a little under the radar. Like, oh, it's not definitely about George Floyd when it clearly it is. But yeah. even if you if you remove it from that, from the context of what it's about, like, it's so awkward. Also, like, we do you hold do we hold these truths to be self-evident? It's like a child song. It is it, like, like it's just song. a schoolhouse rock like <laughs> cadence. Uh, which, like, I'm sorry for insulting Schoolhouse Rock right now. I didn't mean no, it. No, <laughs> Schoolhouse Rock, those songs generally worked. Many yeah. of them are stuck in my head periodically. Be self-evident. Like, this, what, I, like, that's this, a, that's I'm, I'm going song. to pour back teen in my ears to try to get this out of my brain it's once so we finish bad. recording. Also, if you play it back, uh, listeners... The chorus is literally just, I've never had to knock on wood. It's just yeah, that. It's, uh, that's it's the, the only exact, song they have. the exact same tune. Um, God, that's funny. variations because of the uh, syllables and lyri- the beautiful lyricism that they've introduced. <laughs> yes. I the just, the perfect art that is, God. Oh, I can't. This is, it's it's absolutely stunning. It's, um, that That this would happen and that no one would stop it. <laughs> like morally, if you if you if you are ever around and your friends have a ska band and they attempt to make an album about the murder of a black man by the police, it is your moral responsibility to mace them until they stop. Mm-hmm. You have you have an ethical duty. Whatever you are, it takes. It's this like if you fail to do that, it's the same as like watching someone get kicked to death in the street and refusing to intervene. Anyway, Cody, <laughs> whatever it takes. This is Behind the Bastards, a Hi. show about the mighty, mighty Boston's history's greatest monsters. Oh. Do you think Jordan Peterson's ever been able to enjoy a ska song? Could you imagine him skanking? I can, um, really? because I've seen him cry about a bluegrass band he saw uh, in Tennessee. And well, yes. uh, then I saw a video of him dancing to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's actually, it was good. Like there was, yeah. they were a good band and I'm not like a oh, bluegrass, bluegrass or, like, or as we call like, it yeah. country ska. Yeah. Country ska. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, like I got no issue with that kind of music. Uh, it was a good band. Uh, they did a good job, but I think that any, like any music I think moves him, which is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, fine. I, That's the most human powerful. thing I've ever heard about. Exa- him, yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, I think he would skank it. I think he would skank it. I think yeah. he could really. I think he could really get down to, you know, that real big fish song, beer. What if you rewrote it to be about having a single sip of cider and then not <laughs> not sleeping for thirty days, and then, and then saying you didn't sleep for yeah. twenty five days? Like, let's be clear. Well, this has been nine minutes of Cody and Robert talking uh, about all ska. Right. Take off there our are, bowling there shoes are, there and checkered are a, hats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are a solid eleven people in our audience who were waiting for this for years. Oof. And those 11 people are having the best day of their lives. And, yeah. Everyone else has deleted us from their phones. You're welcome to those people. <laughs> Sorry to everybody else. Yeah. So, Cody, when we last left off with Jordan Peterson in this episode. Jordy, he, please. Jordy. <laughs> Jordy. <laughs> he was talking about how women are un- incapable of looking at relationships in anything other than like a cold transactional way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the next thing Peterson does in this episode is stick his brain's dick into the problem <laughs> of mass shootings. <laughs> okay. Did you like that sentence, Cody? You feel uh, good about how I wrote that sentence? I don't hate it. <laughs> Did but... it take your breath away? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Here's Jordan. Thank goodness. <laughs> I think Warren Farrell 
wrote a book called The Boy Crisis, told me yesterday when I was talking to them that every single high school shooter was fatherless. So, I mean, you know, that's a small sample of people, but uh -huh. society yeah. seems to be, let's say, degenerating into a more and more woke direction. Oh, So, Cody, I'm not going to look up his buddy Warren like I did his other friend, because the claim that he's made there, that mass shooters are always fatherless, is complete horseshit. And okay. it's the easiest thing in the world to debunk. I, yeah. I was going to look at, like, and this is a thing that if you're, mm -hmm. if you're a listener of this show and you're like, I actually like Jordan Peterson, I don't know what you're doing here, but thanks for coming. Um, anything he ever says, just be like, what? It's always that wrong. That sounds it's off. A hundred percent of the time, it's at least a little wrong. Um, and this is a lot wrong. Uh, Snopes has covered this, which makes it very easy to debunk. There is a years-long right-wing media claim that mass shootings are committed by fatherless children. This is to demonize single mothers. It's just to demonize the fact that, like, the breakdown of the family and not, I don't know, the fact that, like, look, I'm, a, I'm as pro-gun as they get, but it's the fact that any angry young person can purchase whatever gun they want, even if they have a history of domestic violence, with 60% of them do. If you want to look at the thing that actually most mass shooters have in common, most of them oh, have yeah. a history of violence towards women that doesn't stop them from acquiring a firearm. Anyway, yeah, all of this Yeah, mass shooters and police. Yes, and police, yes. Um, who kill twice as many people as mass shooters in the United States, we should also know. Anyway, the point of origin of this like right wing sort of thing that like this is the problem is single mothers and not anything to do with guns or, or patriarchal violence or whatever. The point of origin for this is an article in The Federalist in 2015, which was later picked up to act as evidence for a Fox News column. It did not claim this Federalist article does not claim, as Peterson does, that every mass shooter is fatherless. Quote, on CNN's list of the 27 deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history, seven of those shootings were committed by young under 30 male since 2005. Of the seven, only one, Virginia Tech shooter Seung Ho... Uh, Hui, uh, so I'm not going to try to pronounce. The Virginia Tech shooter, who had been mentally unstable since childhood, was raised by his biological father throughout childhood. Now... This is also extremely out of date and wrong. Quote, for the purposes of this article, we researched contemporaneous news reports to see if any of the shooters originally listed in CNN's 27 deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history grew up in households without a father. We found that, with a father. We found that several of them did. The Virginia Tech shooter who killed 32 people in Virginia Tech in 2007 was raised by both a father and a mother. So was George Hennard, who killed 23 people in Colleen, Texas in 1921. Charles Whitman, who killed 17 people at the University of Texas at Austin in 1966. Nadal Malik Hassan, who fatally shot 13 people in Fort Hood in 2009. Jivari Wong, who killed 13 in 2009 in Binghamton, New York. And Aaron Alexis, who fatally shot 12 people at the Washington Navy Yard in 2013. James Huberty, who killed 21 people at a McDonald's in the San Ysidro neighborhood of San Diego, California in 1984, was raised by a single father and later a father and a stepmother after his biological mother abandoned the family. So again... These are not, and by the way, this is not a comprehensive list of all of the mass shooters who of course have both not, parents. Yeah. Many of them have. It is complete horseshit to say that they do not have, like, mass shooters are, tend to be fatherless. That's nonsense. Yeah, it's that's like nonsense. Stephen Molyneux shit. Yes. <clears throat> so, Jordan doesn't have... Uh, an editor for content here. Again, he's just kind of talking in a nice room. So he starts off on a rant next about how woke universities are, and, and he winds up repeating at length his arguments from episode one about not saying anything you don't 100% believe in. Again, because there's no editor here, and no one can tell him, hey, Jordan, you went over all this already. Um, and so for the next like couple of minutes, he's just kind of describing things people do without explaining anything of meaning. It's, it's like weirdly pointless, and here's an example. Everybody gets rejected 95% of the time. You only have to succeed once. And then maybe you're not good at interviews and, and maybe you try hard and you don't find another job. And that sucks because you actually tried hard and you failed. And so often people pull their punches so that if they fail, they can always say, well, I didn't really try that hard. Yeah. It's just like, okay. He, he does it's this very a lot. stream of consciousness. Yeah. It's very stream of consciousness, but also it's like, yeah. That's true. Yeah. It's like, uh, there's like, he's got yeah, this... Yeah, it sucks um, when you don't get a job that you interview for. Yeah. Absolutely, Jordan. <laughs> he does, and that's why I think part of why he's so effective and uh, connective for some people 
um, and why a lot of his critics will often be like, but he's a good at this and good at this because he'll say like really basic, almost banal, like, like therapist stuff. Yeah. Like this idea of like, yeah, sometimes people pull their punches so that like when they fail, they can say like, oh, I didn't really try very hard. So it's fine. That's a thing people do. He's absolutely correct. Yes. But like what I do that often. Exactly. But like, okay. <laughs> And so again, go on. Like the, it's this, like, this, yeah. This episode is a mix of like these things. He's just kind of like laying out things that happen in the world, and then he's mixing it in with these like factual statements that are always wrong that he half remembers from friends of his, all of who are right wing propagandists. Like said in articles, they work for Quil- wrote for Quillette or Heritage or whatever. And as the episode goes on, he makes repeated reference to his private clinical practice as a therapist, talking about how he'd laboriously help people rebuild their lives or fix and tractable mental health problems. And this is where things get really messed up. Lots of people would come into my office and they were terrified to be there. They didn't want to be there. It took them like two years to get up the courage to go see a therapist. And so part of my job was to make them as comfortable as I possibly could instantly. And a huge part of that was paying attention to them and not to me. And you can get really good at that. (laughs) Wait a sec. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Brave, brave, brave concept. Yeah, you, this should be about them and not you, Jordan. What are you talking about? Yeah, nobody like, goes to a therapist to works, learn about man. the therapist. I just want to get a therapist and pay 150 bucks a session so I can get to know a dude. What is he doing? Like, we're about? gonna get into what he's talking about, Cody. But first, you know what is the only real kind of therapy? Spending money. Yeah, well, it is, it is in <laughs> fact, ska. Look, you go to a fucking Streetlight Manifesto concert and tell me that you didn't just have a religious experience. I will. I, I dare you to, Cody. Dare accept it. Ah, uh, okay. So we're back. Jordan Peterson has just talked about how you he became friends and get, gets all of his patients to trust him, right? About how, like, that's a real struggle as a therapist, getting these people to trust them and about how good he is at it. Um, and the fact that he's talking about, like, how important it was to gain the trust of these troubled people who came to him looking for mental health advice, um, that made me want to look up, like, what happened with his actual patients because he's no longer in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought maybe there's a story there and boy, howdy, I came across. No. uh, Yeah. I came across an article in the magazine Canada land about the end of Jordan Peterson's clinical practice. Now this occurred as he became a media figure and he went from obscure academic to wealthy celebrity. And one of the first things Jordan did when this happened is abandon the patients that he'd built a rapport with quote, Shortly before, Peterson decided he couldn't both be a media personality and a practicing psychologist at the same time. He canceled sessions with patients, later claiming illness while maintaining an appointment to appear on television. He responded to messages from patients with auto-reply emails, which brought up the challenges of his burgeoning fame, directing recipients to send argumentative emails to his ideological opponents. He employed his wife to sort through emails from patients without first asking for their consent. He shared potentially identifying information about patients with other patients. Oh my so, god. That's really bad, right? That's really bad. That's horrible. Unethical. That's deeply unethical and yeah. kind of evil. That's um, not just fuck. kind, that's evil. That's, yeah, that's really evil and selfish and cruel. Um d- deeply like potentially disturbing to be honest. Like yeah. potentially something that could even have a body count. Yeah. Because being a therapist is a thing like a number of people who are attending therapy are doing it because suicide is a thing they consider regularly. And if they let you in and trust you and then you like both abandon them because you get famous and also tell them, Hey, send emails harassing people. I don't like, <laughs> like, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. For, okay. Like, yeah, you're trusting this person and they cancel and then you see them on TV. That's fucked up. What, like, could you repeat the part about the emails to his opponents? Yeah, it was like um, this long. It's dir- like this long list of just he like directed up recipients things. to send argumentative emails to his ideological opponents. So wait, so he emailed his patients to email yeah his yeah. This opponents? was like, I think this was a thing. And let me let me pull up the art. It's been a while since I read it. Let me pull up the article again and find that's just so messed. More detail like, for you. What the fuck is wrong with this guy? <sighs> but, well, weirdo. I think we know what's wrong with him. I, He's do. a fucking uh, narcissist who God. wanted money. <laughs> yeah. That is like, 
That's va- that's that, that all is, you, that's I, all you I, need to I know wish I had found this article when you and I were doing the Peterson episodes yeah. that we did. Um, because this is legitimately like the worst thing I've heard about him. That's all you need to know about him. Like, yep. that's, oh my God. All right. Well, so basically this article, a lot of it focuses on one of his patients, Samantha, who like he cancels an appointment with her saying that he's sick and then he shows up on TV the next night. This is like right when all that stuff breaks with that Canadian like change to hate laws and stuff. Um, Quote, when Samantha responded to an email that offered new dates to meet, she received what appeared to be an auto reply aimed at his growing number of supporters attempting to mobilize a letter writing campaign in his battle against political correctness at the university. Hi. Thank you for writing. At the moment, I am unable to keep up with my email correspondence, although I will try at some point in the future to respond personally. (laughs) If you are emailing me about current PC-related issues, you should consider sending your comments to the following individuals. Remember that the only way that any of this can be straightened out is through carefully articulated and reasonable arguments. I would say that the vast majority of letters I have received have been exactly that, and it's just what is needed. Assume rationality on the part of the recipients and make a careful case. We want to play in the court of reason. CC a copy to me if you wish. And then the message gave email addresses for like seven University of Toronto officials who had uh, gone after him for his refusal to refer to students by their preferred gender pronouns. So that's what's happening is this woman, he builds a rapport with her. She's like comes to rely on him for her mental health care. And then he like ghosts her and all she gets is auto replies telling her to harass people at the university on his behalf. That's that's literally what happens there, which is profoundly abusive. Is, that's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard about Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Um, that is in the top three, at least. <laughs> yeah. There's a long list. I have to sort through it, but that's like really <laughs> fucked up. That's uh, really deeply really fucked up to, it just speaks so much to who he is and what he's yeah. all about. Yeah. And there's a number of ethics complaints that get filed against Peterson by patients who found themselves discarded by him in his rush to capitalize on fame. Um, Obviously, he doesn't talk about any of this on the show, right? He just talks about how good he is at building a rapport with people and getting them to trust him. And not Um, talking about himself or whatever. And not talking about himself, focusing on them. God, God, what a fucking creep. What a piece of shit. Fucking creepy weirdo. So he spends several minutes talking about his friends in school who were all, again, this is now he's gone back to like talking about his own childhood, about people he used to know as a kid. And all of his friends were super uh, like, or well, all of his friends in like high school were like super tough, cool kids who worked on oil rigs. Uh, he starts talk, telling the story about how one of his friends got into a fight with their swimming coach and they were both cool, like super cool. And then Jordan forgets to tell us the end of the story and talks about how Jocko Willink is cool too. What? <laughs> He's just like, he's just like talking about his cool friends in oil rigs and how they got into a fight with the coach and they're both so manly. You know who else is manly is the Navy SEAL with a podcast, Jocko Willink, who, again, I'm not, I have no particular opinions on Jocko. I'm not attacking him. Jordan Peterson just goes into a rant about how cool he is because he's like Jordan's friends who got into fights with their swimming coach. <laughs> For the record, I don't think Jocko Willink ever got into a fight with a swimming coach. <laughs> that I would, I would believe you. <laughs> Here, here's the clip. You're going to want to do it on your own terms. And our school system's very bad at facilitating that. In fact, it does everything. It was even designed at the beginning to not facilitate that because our school system was based on the Prussian military model. And the Prussians, who also trained the Japanese to establish their school systems, by the way, they wanted to produce obedient factory workers and obedient. So uh, first off, this is what after he's randomly talking about how his friends were super cool oil rig workers who got into fist fights with their coach. This is what leads to him talking about like modern education and how broken it is. Like the idea that it was better back when kids would just work on oil rigs and get into fist fights with coaches. And now it's they're all Prussian school modeled in terrible and like everybody's being trained to be obedient drones. Wait now, a second. He yeah. likes that, though. Well, no, he doesn't because uh, I that's that's a great point, Cody, but he doesn't now. <laughs> what, so what the f- 
what's important is that he's made another falsifiable statement here, right? That Japan based their schooling on the Prussian model. Yeah. Now, the Prussian Not just based model, on, but like we're taught by them, like yes. trained by them to do yes. it. Yeah. The Prussian model is a thing. Japan did not base their schooling system on Prussian re- learning alone, no, nor did the Prussians just like teach them how to do schooling. From 1873 to 1890, Japan reformed their educational system, and they didn't do it just like by bringing in people to teach them how to do it. They didn't base their their new education system on any one nation's methods. And what they did was the very reasonable thing. They adopted a number of different methods from several countries and then tested a bunch of them out at the same time so that they could learn through trial and error what seemed to work best. They did, in fact, study and test aspects of the Prussian system. They also tested and studied aspects of the American and French education systems. Um, Almost like they didn't just want to create robotic drones, but Mm. were really just like trying to solve the difficult problem of like what works for an educational system. Prussia, the late 1800s, very successful country. So is the United States and so is France. And so they're kind of like being like, well, these three countries are succeeding in ways we want to succeed. Let us test aspects of their educational systems to see what works for us, which is not what Peterson is saying no. because he he's wrong the, about everything. No, he said the Prussians train them how to do the school, which is what's based on it. And that's, he does this it all also, the time. It it's is interesting. A, yeah. He's like, it's so maddening. Cause like clearly he reads a lot. He's yes. a reader. He reads a lot. And he, he half uh, remembers like most of us do, Bits and pieces of what right. he read. Yeah. He like he like kind of absorbs a little bit or like these tidbits yeah. that that he like moves around so that they align with whatever he is thinking at the time and like just says like as fact this thing that's like, well, ten percent of that was right. Yeah, like, you're right. The Japanese did test out met aspects of the Prussian education system. Um, but you're missing what actually happened in Japan in that period. Right. And, There's like, okay, subject and object are right. The verbs yeah. are all wrong. Like, it, what you- it's, it, it, yeah. I, I think a thing that is kind of worth highlighting here is the denial of agency of J- Japanese people. Like the way he frames it, the Prussians came in and taught them how to build an education system that would train their children into like little robots and that that's what happened. As opposed to the Empire of Japan exercising considerable agency going out and testing different methods to try and reform their system in a way that would allow them to achieve their goals, which is what happened, right? Yeah. Because Japan Uh, is famously a country that exercises quite a bit of agency. Yeah. (laughs) But like, yeah. And like they they did the thing that he would support. Like you test this, you test this, you test this and you find the best result. And like, is he trying to make a connection to what he was talking about earlier with like, Japanese men? Yeah, I think so. I think he is. Like, that's why he brought it up, right? Yeah, even though, like, there are, you might argue, a significant thing that happens about uh, 60 years after (laughs) Japan reforms its educational system that leads to kind of some social breaks that might be more relevant for looking at things that are happening to young Japanese men in 2022. Not that his, not that what he said earlier about Japanese men in 2022 was accurate either. Right, 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 right. Is like I, I don't know, Jordan. I think something happened in the mid '40s that might have caused a break in the way Japanese society mm-hmm. handled stuff no, like no, education. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> anything that's, that's environmental yeah. stuff. That's yeah. Not... Okay. Okay, Doctor Peterson. God. So uh, anyway, he's just. This doesn't have a huge thing to do with his other claims. It's just like he's he's always wrong. Anyway, yeah. here's another clip. <laughs> don't sell yourself short. And don't let the people who demand slavish obedience, you know, that puppy dog style of living, don't let them short circuit your future because, you know, you're not inclined towards that kind of obedience. That's actually a virtue, not a vice, even though it's punished in, well, certainly in schools, especially by Oedipal female teachers. Ah. Although yeah. you know, there's no shortage of men who are participating in that as well. Ah. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. I, My man. I just knew based on like the, the the like cool split screen thing, the super yeah. cool that it's just yeah. so, so so great visually. Um, that, that he was gonna say some fuck shit. <laughs> I I love whenever because you have these moments where like there's this little slip. He loses a little bit of composure, and it's like ah, you hate women, right? Yeah, like that's yeah. Man. You're really deeply angry at women. Um, Oof. yeah. 
that's I mean fun. that couple with like yeah like all the stuff he's been saying like this that like dating above their status and like the uh, fatherless uh, it's like single mothers and mass shooters like all this stuff it's like man you're just so deeply angry at the concept of women um, that's pretty cool I think but also but also like it it's only what he's talking about too is just like you know obedience is like you know don't be a slave to blah 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 it's like but you would disagree with that if it was about something you agree with you would be like well no you like you you follow orders you like you do this you do this you find your place and you like you follow steps in your hierarchy to do x and y um it's just so just his it's like context ideology dependent and it's just fun to see him pretend that he doesn't he doesn't think that way yeah you know what else is fun to pretend cody uh, some Oedipal mother. It's fun to pretend fucking, that we could know. ever live in a world without the products and services that support this podcast. But of course, we couldn't. There is no life without these products and services. God Existence no. itself is meaningless without whatever comes up next as soon as I stop talking. Ah, we're back. And I Ooh, hope yeah. that your lives have been filled with meaning um mm. the only meaning you will ever experience family means nothing mm-hmm. your own children mean nothing mm-hmm. love is but a vapor in the air but the products and services that support this podcast are god in a very real way cody yeah yeah I, that's good no disagreement mm-hmm Cool. So the very next thing that happens in the Jordan Peterson TV show is this very this really weirdly sharp cut followed by the title text. Can men be controllable monsters? Oh, he (laughs) loves talking about this stuff. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's a question that only psychopaths ask themselves. Um, So you got to tame. You got to accept the monstrous aspects of you and uh, be a monster (laughs) in order to be a whatever he'll say it it's fine i know yeah. exactly what he's gonna say he, he talks about young in nietzsche a lot and it's honestly oh, yeah. it's not very interesting there's a long kind of rambling rant here but i want to play where it leads him to this is him kind of like reaching his conclusions you might have fantasies of revenge sometimes very violent if you're extremely sexually deprived or maybe not even that extremely you'll have sexual fantasies and if you're revengeful and look up bro and feeling oppressed and then you might have violent sexual fantasies that's a part of you so let's say that's the shadow i just want to point out that he only looked into the camera when he he was like violence sexual fantasies yeah (laughs) oh god it's it's all like this and there's a cut coming up in which the screen splits in three focusing on (laughs) focusing on jordan's hands then a close shot of his face and then the wide shot of him sitting in a chair nothing interesting happens during this he does not make any points there is no like (laughs) big conclusion he builds to i just the editing decisions in this video what was this text on screen just then (laughs) Oh, oh, scroll back. Why don't we just play that segment? Let's give Cody a little. Where'd that come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a head. It's a head. Oh, it's a head? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, It's a head. 30 minutes in, and there's just text appearing. Yeah, the the, the text is women want a tameable beast. (laughs) There we we go. Um, Yeah. He loves Uh, talking about it. Yeah, it's amazing. So his train of thought, as that might key you in on, leads him to another Disney movie. Thank God. And here's him talking about that. Story of Beauty and the Beast. And so in the Disney version, which does a very nice job of laying this out, Beauty is an entirely commendable female. She's attractive and wise, intelligent, beauty. ethical, devoted to her father, but not in a pathological <laughs> way, independent. She has everything going for her. She's the target of the advances of a narcissistic Machiavellian, Gaston, who's like a parody of masculinity. He's sort of, uh-huh. you might think about him as the, <laughs> as the feminist's patriarchal nightmare in animated form. Uh, 
said no one ever. What? What are you doing? Well, what, what he's doing? not a nightmare so much as a caricature, he's in a movie. right? Yeah. It's a movie, isn't it? But like, it's, it's a so movie, weird. and he's Gaston is the bad guy because he's everything Jordan Peterson wants a man to be. He's deeply concerned with hierarchy. He is unable to consider like the validity of other people's experiences. He is deeply anti woke. He is he is he extracts unthinkingly from the world around him in order to increase his own uh uh like power and his own like relative level of wealth in society like he is everything jordan peterson thinks it's good for a man to be uh which is what he's a caricature he's a caricature of you jordan right yeah and like the movement you're supporting it's so weird to also it's funny <laughs> He and like, you know, the Shapiro's of the world, they just can't like whenever they see something like that, they can't they like short circuit in a way because mm-hmm. he wants to talk about Beauty and the Beast in a way that's like, oh, it's meaningful and it means this and it demonstrates this. And like, here's what it says about life and it's good. But there's this character who reminds me of me. <laughs> so yeah. he's bad. Like the idea that they're like, he's just scoffing at this. this well, he, what he's saying it, is like, that like rather than. Beauty and the Beast was even in the fucking whenever that movie was made, like the '60s, right? Even in this less this less woke era, the people who made Beauty and the Beast were specifically saying, like, masculinity, toxic masculinity of the sort that Peterson embodies, is something to be mocked and derided. Um, which is like what they hate the most. Yeah, which is uh, what they hate the most because the message of that is that like things get better for this like like monstrous aggressive individual because he's fundamentally capable of change and like listening to others and learning from them and everything good that happens to him and happens in the story is because he's capable of listening to and learning from a woman is Um, he just like (laughs) ramping up to critique like feminist movements like me too is that what he's doing yeah i think that's kind of where we're let's let's continue okay from where we left he's off. He's all bluster, and although he's attractive, it's a superficial attractiveness that often characterizes narcissists. And beauty is wise enough to actually prefer the beast, who's a beast, but also capable of standing up to Gaston and also prevailing, which is the advantage of the beast-like element. Wait a second. But also capable of being enticed yeah. by beauty, and maybe literally so, into a, first of all, a productive orientation for his proclivity for aggression and also into a productive and generous relationship and beauty being a wise woman and oriented towards the good and characterized by a positive relationship with her father, which is stressed, by the way, in that movie, wants a tameable beast. And first off, we'll continue in a second. I it's been a minute since I've seen that. Isn't one of the points of it that he's actually like not super violent like he he makes like big threats and he blusters but he never like hurts her nor is he a violent threat to the rest of the village no uh he's only a violent threat to gaston yes briefly at the end because uh he's like bringing a mob of people um that was so interesting to see him be like yeah yeah. like it's like it's he's capable she has to control his beastliness in order to defeat this narcissist and like right well i actually think the point of it is that he's not really a beast he just looks scary because of a curse but is actually kind of a decent man with some emotional trouble who needs to work through his problems yeah like he becomes is that not the actual point of the story that he's not quite a monster gentle by the end um <laughs> yeah. it's um, so I'm, weird that I'm, he led with that i'm just saying update to dating profile must be four years older than me and be a hashtag tameable beast be a tameable beast that's right <laughs> be a tameable beast <laughs> Anyway, a lot of guys would be like, that's Oh, yeah. Me. Finally. <laughs> Finally. Finally. There she is. Why don't you keep playing for a little bit longer here? Oh, we did, the, we did the rest of the thing that you marked. No, no, no. I, I want to get to the point where he talks about how women like erotic literature. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I've seen let's, him, let's do I've this. I've seen uh, before, okay. before, uh, sorry, before we, before we mm-hmm. play this, I yeah, have yeah. seen, again, all this stuff is stuff he's talked about like 90 million times on mm-hmm. other podcasts and vlogs and stuff. I have seen him talk about what he is about to talk about mm-hmm. with his daughter. <laughs> Productive and competent, but also capable of enough aggression to keep the real monsters at bay. 
And th that's a very narrow needle eye for women to thread because you need a man who's aggressive enough to keep the real monsters away, but simultaneously agreeable enough, empathic enough, generous enough to be good with kids, to be good with her, and to share. And so that's a very fine line. And the taming of the beast is in some sense the negotiated establishment of that line. So there's a book um, called A Billion Wicked Thoughts that was written by Google engineers who are quite reliable social scientists when they put their minds to it, engineer types, because they tend to follow the data independent of any political inclination. I'm and they looked sorry. at yeah. patterns mm -hmm. of pornography use among men and women, drawing on literally billions of, of data points, a billion wicked thoughts. And they found something that had been reported previously, but this was on a very large scale, that men use visual pornography. I don't think that comes as a shock to anyone, but that women's preferred pornographic art form is literary. The women like stories. And they analyzed the canonical yes, female pornographic fantasy. And it's basically, surprise, surprise, Fifty Shades of Grey. And so the Google engineers identified five categories of men that were often the feature target for the romantic and erotic adventures of the female protagonist in the pornographic stories. Pirate, vampire, surgeon, billionaire, and one I can never remember. But you get the idea. It's high okay, status. Okay, now pause it here. <laughs> it said werewolf. It said it's werewolf. werewolf. It's werewolf. The one he cannot <laughs> remember is werewolf. Uh, yeah, remember it's later, on the screen. Like, make sure you put werewolf on Make sure you put werewolf in there. And like, there's so much that's wrong here. Number one, I don't know. Uh, obviously, a, a, a number of women find it attractive when a man is like, muscular or strong or like large there's something comfortable especially if you're smaller about that uh that is like a thing that occurs in the world um but it's not because those men are tameable beasts and in fact i would argue that as in my experience um it tends to be deeply off-putting if you feel like somebody is barely holding in check their aggressiveness like, it's nice to be with someone if you're who like you feel like, oh, if something bad happens, this person will react well and can help me stay safe and can protect people around me. That is an attractive trait. It's like if a fire breaks out and you happen to have someone there who has experience fighting fires and they put the fire out, that is attractive. It is attractive to know, oh, that person can handle themselves in a dangerous situation, right? All people find that attractive, men and women. It's always an attractive trait for very obvious reasons. What very few people find attractive is feeling, wow, this person could fly off the handle and become a dangerous, violent person at any second. Yes. <laughs> right, because yes. what he's talking about are... are uh, fantasies uh he's used that word many times that's what he's talking about and in these fantasies they're not like we pirate it's not a violent angry pirate with a short fuse no. uh who could it's hurt the her. charming erudit who's you know he's violent he's doing a violent job but he's not inherently a violent man and when you get to know it's the there's a reason why an entire generation of women in the West fell in love with Carrie Elways in uh, fucking um, the Princess Bride. The Princess Di because he's yeah he's this pirate, but fundamentally, the instant you talk to him, he doesn't. He's not this unchecked, violent madman. He's a deeply urbane, erudite, charming individual, and that's incredibly attractive. Yeah, like, I mean, looking for a man four years older, hashtag mm -hmm. table beast, but yeah. also can, a literal can pirate sword fight. or a literal mm -hmm. werewolf. Not, but pick, also, not picky. Again, <laughs> the two deeply handsome men in uh, who have a, a generation of men and women fell in love with in The Princess Diary, Indigo Montoya and uh, Carrie Elwes is the Dread Pilot, Princess Bride is the Dread Pirate Roberts, are both like deeply thoughtful and emotionally yeah, connected suave, gentle yeah. uh and yeah. yes. um, Gent gentle very gentle and merciful as a general rule mm -hmm. um uh, yeah they treat uh buttercup uh wonderfully the entire time uh fez like they're all it's just what a fucking i'm sorry it's incredible sorry. it's incredible um, but also like even his is uh the thing he's citing he's like oh, surprise surprise it's 50 shades of gray um and i'm not i have not read 50 shades of gray um i've like read funny reviews of it a little bit but like I'm pretty sure 
the gray character who by, but the main character's name is Christian Gray which yeah, is Yeah yeah the billionaire um, guy but like yeah. he's not like a violent vicious man it's an arrangement that they have made yeah, where a consensual she feels sexual safe. arrangement it's a sexual yes. arrangement where she feels safe in that relationship yeah. to open herself up and feel and be vulnerable in that scenario it's not like ooh he's like a fucking violent like sadist and i'm gonna but i'm gonna tame him like that's not what it's about right there's this there's this thing and we're we're gonna tread into some dicey territory you can find a number of men who wrote particularly back in the 70s really bad essays about the fact that rape is a really common sexual fantasy right that a lot of sexual fantasies involve assault and domination in that way bernie sanders wrote a terrible essay hunter (laughs) thompson wrote a terrible essay and as somebody who has repeatedly interviewed like people who professionally, sometimes in a clinical sense, um, help people engage with fantasies like that, part of the reason why those are so common is they allow people who have been victimized to take power and agency mm-hmm. in a situation that was deeply traumatic to them and kind of recreate and explore that 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 experience while being able to take agency and control Mm -hmm. this time. And that is a, that is a reason why that is a thing that people, but I I don't think a guy like Jordan is capable of understanding that instead he interprets it as women actually want this, a diversion of this to happen to them rather than like, well, people who are traumatized may seek to explore the thing that traumatized them in a way in which they have more agency. Uh, Yeah. um, It's uh, kind of fucked up that he's a psychologist it's and, really and fucked really up that he's a psychologist up. this is a deeply stud of studied like mm-hmm. piece of like sexual psychology a lot has been written by clinicians about why people do the things in some of this role playing that they do like this is a thing people study academically that I don't think he's ever read about because it would it would make him uncomfortable yeah it bursts his uh, little bubble um, mm-hmm. I feel like he said these had like tweets about this like Mm -hmm. uh like about i feel like it was about muslims yeah and like desiring like i don't even want to find it it doesn't matter no it's not it's just again he's 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 wrong about everything um just like he's wrong about werewolves because he forgot them which is funny because that's like look if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna list things that are common in erotic fiction like werewolf is going to be the top of everybody's werewolf and say, pirate, right? Werewolves and pirates. Like, like I wonder, like, cause there's like, he's like, and then there's a fourth one and I can't remember it. And then text yeah. on screen said werewolf. I wonder if they didn't know, like yeah. part of me feels like, cause he, I think he just like probably talks and then leaves and isn't like privy to like what it turns out as he's not like in the editing room, you know, yeah. being like, Oh dude, text here. It's just some fucking person gotta watch this and cut to a shot of his hands or whatever so i feel like the editor like guessed <laughs> and yeah. like oh uh pirates vampire uh, uh, werewolves too and it, that's <laughs> why it says werewolves not because that's what he couldn't think of but because the editor had to fill it in yeah it's um you know what i would like to do with jordan peterson if i could i would like to sit him Knock down on and I would like to make him watch the movie Wolf Cop. And I would like him to interpret the film Wolf Cop, particularly the scene in which the main character bursts Dick Force first into a werewolf. It's the most incredible scene in cinematic history. Nothing has ever compared to it. God, I, I love am, Wolf Cop. I am just now hearing of it. Have you not seen Wolf Cop? He I turns am... cock first into a werewolf, Cody, and you see it all. What the fuck? You it is everything? amazing. You see, you see everything. You, you see you. everything. Wolf amazing. Cop. Watch it. I'm checking out the trailer right now. It is. He threw it up is, in his car. What the fuck? He sure did. He's a very drunk cop. The main ah, character is a drunk cop. Wait, is that why he threw up? Cause he, yes, because he's wasted. Yeah. He is like he is like the sheriff in Jaws level alcoholic. Damn. It's awesome. Um, and then the best thing about it is after he becomes a werewolf, he doesn't stop being a cop. He's both a hundred percent werewolf and a hundred percent cop at the mm. same time, which is groundbreaking. Cody. I mean, that's why he's a wolf cop, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Wow. Anyway, let's get I, back I, to Jordan. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. P- pirate, vampire, and wolf cop, and wolf cop. So, um, 
It's very funny. Uh, so he he goes into this misunderstanding of this Google study to say that it's really important that all of these preferred female fantasy men um, were like these these fantasies remained in place during Me Too. Oh, um, like that's the, he thought he think that's a big deal. We did like, it. Even we got there. We did it. I knew you, it was. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it. Anyway, here's how he describes the Me Too movement. <sighs> Just taking a deep sigh. All male will is potentially corrupted by power and to be regarded with suspicion and legal regulation. Well, that's far too extreme and, and preposterous. And so what you have is a compensatory fantasy emerge that's highlighting the value that's not being properly attended to by the culture. And it possesses people in an unconscious manner, you might say, uh, in an attempt to bring them back to the middle. And anyways, that's all part of the tameable monster. And so is it? Is it also the, the, is the it, Jordan? Like, hand motions during that exact part were just spectacularly it? distracting? <laughs> it's it, his need to like make these things complex and deeper than like he, it's it was easy for men to get away with assaulting women and they didn't like that. It's and there so was, frustrating. Like, <laughs> like listening to him talk about this stuff. It's like, no, man, just like it. <sighs> People don't like to be assaulted, Jordan. <laughs> like the the like why me too happened is extremely simple it was easy for powerful men to get away with abusing women and the women didn't like they didn't that. like it and also a lot of men didn't like it because it's fucked up and horrible <laughs> like people didn't people like that don't like that it's bad. Some people did, and those people are bad. Yeah, those <laughs> like, people are terrible, and we wanted them out of our society. No, 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 we need to tame them. They're the tameable beasts. Look, you can even phrase that in, like, a stupid mythic term where, like, fundamentally society is all sheep and wolves, and the wolves were preying on the sheep, but dressing as the wolf, it's the evil uncle and the crone, and the, I don't know, whatever. I'm not going to try to do that. Like, you can do I a mean, better job he, of this than me, Cody. That's what he would say. Um, yeah. <laughs> So after this, he restates for like the fifth fucking time that a man who can be aggressive but also knows how not to be aggressive is the most useful kind of man, mm -hmm. which is like pointless. Yes, aggression is sometimes necessary. So it is it is good to be capable of aggression and also know when that's not appropriate. Like, obviously, that's the same as saying, like, it's good to know when you should use a kitchen knife as opposed to putting the kitchen knife away so you don't accidentally cut somebody. Well, yes, Jordan, it is good to not just swing a kitchen knife around. There's a time and a place for that knife. Everyone knows this. Um, also, the same is true of women, uh, where it's you need to be aggressive sometimes and other times it's inappropriate to be aggressive. That is true of all human beings. Like sometimes human beings will need to be aggressive, but most of the time they won't need to be. And knowing the difference is critical. Obviously, Jordan. Um I don't know. His episode peters out to a completely nonsensical closing <laughs> statement. Because because he was not He's a way more useful man than one who cannot do that for lack of ability or because he's imposed or incorporated arbitrary moral constraints on his perceptions and behavior that stop him from, well, from, from, from being able to say no, for example, because saying no is an act of aggression. Because what no means, no means stop doing that or something you do not like will absolutely 100% happen to you. And so without that, there's no capacity to say no. And well, yeah. if you can't say no, you can't negotiate, you can't, you can't move forward, you can't, yeah. you can't live your own life. You can't put limits on Machiavellians, you can't oppose narcissists, you mm -hmm. can't emerge unscathed from people who use empathy in a manipulative way. You can't put constraints on a bad, be badly behaving two-year-old. Oh, and good, so, we get the song. No and aggression, those are, an integrated aggression, those are pretty much exactly the same thing. What? 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 Yes. Pretty much exactly same, the same, same thing. thing is inherently an act of violence. It is impressive to say no. And he's saying that because, like, you can't say no without the threat of force. But, for example, the other night, my friends were going out to dance, and they asked if I wanted to go. And I said no, 
<laughs> and you know what I didn't was not present at all was the fact that I might harm them physically if they asked me again. Right. Well, like right. there was it's, no it's, threat. It was just I was asked if I wanted to do a thing and I stated that I did not. <laughs> right. Because like the, what he's like assuming that like it's not just like the no is violence. It's the initial question is violence. Yeah. Too. Everything is violence. It's like just everything violence is meeting violence. Violence. And so rejecting that is also implicit yeah. violence. And also, like as a general, even in the because he's obviously means a lot of this is like a in a like a, in a sexual way. Like if a man asks something of a woman and she says no, that's violence on her part too. Because the, it, it, obviously she can only back up the fact that like she doesn't want him to do something if she's willing to use force, which Aggression is nonsense. Force, because I think yeah. it, it is it, for the most part. In human society, when, like, people ask, do you want to do, like, hey, do you want to make out or whatever or have some sort of, like, physical uh, arrangement and the other person says no, as a general rule, most people are like, oh, okay. And there's not a threat of violence because most people don't want to be rapists. I do feel like that's probably yeah, safe. One ho- yeah, one hopes. Uh, yeah. I th- I, uh, <sighs> that is somewhat of a statement of faith on my part, but, Yeah. But I mean, according to Jordan, that's not true. <laughs> yes, according to Jordan, that's not true. It's the threat of violence on both sides, period. What a fucking weirdo. Um, uh, yeah. Also, like, just what a weird way to end. Um, but, like, it's just, again, it's one of those things where he's, like, he's talking these grandiose terms and in some ways just misrepresenting things and just saying fucked up, like, uh, like hard-lined rules about how everybody is and how everybody should act. But what he's talking about like almost is like yeah it's good to set boundaries and be able to say no which which okay yeah but also saying no is inherently not an act of violence right no like it's yeah. got, it's like it's like packaged in all this other stuff that is like it would be it would be fair to say that like sometimes because of because of the fact that many men have bad boundaries and are aggressive in an unhinged way women may need to know how to say no in a in a way that is aggressive and that implies a degree of threat because mm-hmm. they may be in a situation where they are themselves threatened that's a fair statement but also number 1 that's not ever going to be generally true and number 2 we should be moving as a society to a situation in which people don't have to say no as a th- as, with uh, the threat as, of aggression behind it yeah. like because that's bad that's always a bad thing when that happens anyway Jordan Peterson. I mean, he's talked about this before in terms of yeah. like how you can't like, is it like you can't, uh, you can't control, uh, crazy women cause you can't be violent with them. But mm-hmm. if you're a man, I can, the threat of violence is there, but if you're a woman, it's not. So you can't do anything. So don't there's know. nothing to control women. Yes. It's just a weird uh, fucking guy. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, uh, I feel like he's not a good person, Cody. I think maybe, um, maybe that's true. I think, that uh those emails and the, the how he treated his patients is pretty indicative that he's not a very good person aside from everything else he's ever said um and how he's used the world not yeah. a fan not a fan not a fan cody you know what i am a fan of what's that is you oh yeah me too cody times yeah. where where because i've never met you before this sure. is the first time we're talking if I wanted to find mm-hmm. things that you make and or create on the internet, where would I find those? Oh, so many places or just a few. Uh, YouTube, uh, I have a show called Some More News. And, wow. Uh, where all the podcasts are, a show called Even More News. Wow. And you can support either of those at patreon.com slash some more news. And I've got uh, the websites, social media with my name, Cody Johnston, is there. Your name is Cody Johnston. Amazing. Twitter and Instagram and uh, my band, The Hot Shapes, will be available quite soon for all listeners to hear our album about. I'm not even going to joke about it. (laughs) Cody, I am as excited now as the mighty, mighty boss tones were when they realized that there was a cultural tragedy to exploit in order to sell an album. An entire album about an it. Enti- an entire album. My God. My, My God. God. Not even like one song. <laughs> Not even a whole album. Like if there'd been one song, I'd be like, well, 
you know, it was misguided, a rough year, but... whatever, misguided, but I get it. Like you, you, you felt the need to express yourself. Okay. Whole album. My God. Anyway, find yeah. the guys from the mighty, mighty boss tones and, and, and hit them. Yeah. Or like, or go up to them and say, no. <laughs> Yeah. You know who didn't do shit like this is Dropkick Murphys. They just beat the fuck out of Nazis on stage. Right. Cause Damn right. They're okay. All right. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.